Amen. So a large defense contractor finally succeeded in building a computer able to solve any strategic or tactical problem. Military leaders assembled in front of the new machine and were instructed to feed, feed a difficult tactical problem into it. They described a hypothetical situation to the computer and then asked a pivotal question, attack or retreat? The computer hummed away for an hour and then came up with the answer, yes. The generals looked at each other stupefied. Finally, one of them submitted a second request to the computer, yes what? Instantly, the computer responded, yes, sir. <laughs> and just you can't miss an opportunity to tell a dad joke, what kind of tea did the American colonists want? Liberty. <laughs> there you go. All right, let's get on to the Bible rather than the bad jokes from Pastor Peter. Uh, so ultimately, as we continue in the book of Philippians, we really are in this section where go Paul goes into personal information, and we'll see why that is so important in terms of just how we understand the Bible and regard the Bible. You know, recognize that Paul's in prison at this point. And again, he cares to Philippians. He cares about the churches that he has established. You know, he sends these letters to them as a means for their encouragement, but he's also aware of the personal contact, the personal uh, relationships that would need, be needed in terms of someone being present, in terms of, hey, can I get a question for you? Hey, can you help me understand this aspect of life? Or, you know, holding people accountable. You know, it's not just word presented to us, but it's people in terms of relationship. And that's really what this passage of Philippians is all about. So now here, Paul, who is the apostle, again, he started all these churches, feels responsible for all of them. He has certain emissaries that he's going to send along, and so Timothy is one of those emissaries. We pretty much can assume that the Philippians did not know Timothy very well, because in the passage we're in, he is commending Timothy to them. Basically he's saying, you know, I can't be there, but I'm sending you the next best thing, is effectively what these verses, particularly from 19 to 24, um, are communicating about him. And so let's see what we glean from it in terms of our understanding. In verse 19 of Philippians 2, it says this, I hope in the Lord to send Timothy to you that it also may be, so that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare, for everyone looks out for his own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son and with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me, and I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. And so we kind of ended in the middle of verse 20 last week, and so I really want to focus on this phrase where it talks about having a genuine, genuine interest in your welfare. You know, again, he's first saying this about Timothy in terms of just recognizing why they should regard Timothy when he comes. They should appreciate the heart that he has for them. Again, this is not a guy that is, uh, even though he's uh, maybe a bit of a stranger to them, he's not a stranger to their situation. He's not a stranger to the, to the re reality and knowledge of Christ. He's not a stranger to the ministry that is being called to, and he has a genuine heart for them. You know, when I think about the Christian life, there's really a lot of things in the Christian life that we can fake. You know, you think about the things that we would fake in terms of humility, purity, Bible knowledge, strong prayer life, like we're in public, we're around people, and look at me, look at the scriptures I know, look at how well I pray, you know, look at how humble I appear before you. Not that I would ever encourage you to do that, but sometimes we can do that. You know what's hard to fake? It's hard to fake love. It's hard to fake genuine interest. And yet that is what God is calling us to. He's calling us to take care for each other in significant ways. Like not just to have casual relationships, just not have, you know, intermittent conversation on a Sunday morning, but delving into each other's lives, you know, recognizing the things we struggle with, recognizing the accountability we need in our lives, the support we need in our lives. And that, that doesn't happen outside of relationship. You know, in terms of what we would be to each other, Really, trust is an essential part of that. Like how much I trust you will ultimately depend on how much I share with you, right? I mean, I'm not going to share some, some, something with someone that I don't trust. And who do we trust? We trust people that have a genuine interest in us. 
And so I think that's what Paul is saying about Timothy, but we need to think about to what extent we have a genuine interest in other people. You know, recognize that whenever the Bible talks about something, it's about what we would do as opposed to what we would receive. Like the point of this passage is not say, yeah, people should have a genuine interest in me. Like, why don't people have a genuine interest? No, 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 you have a genuine interest in people, and you'll be surprised that all of a sudden they'll have a genuine interest in you. But the first thing that we would be encouraged in, in terms of what the Bible would instruct us in, is striving with the part that we play in the context of that. But again, it's hard to fake that. You know, like with with so many things in the Christian life, there's things that we can do to and be intentional about to build up different capacities and, and direction that the Bible would give. I mean, interacting with people, listening, remembering, caring, you know, all the things. Like, you will not genuinely be concerned for people that you don't interact with, that you're not getting to know them, that in the context of what you know about them, you're expressing care, you're expressing concern. You know, sometimes the best, the best way to do that is you remember things. Like, in other words, you talk to someone about something going on in their life, and then the next time you see them, you say, hey, how's that thing going? As opposed to... Uh, what was that thing? <laughs> you know, it, it shows, you know, go, your, your heart towards them. Like, I, I'm actually amazed at how bad the world is getting in that. I'm not sure about you, but I know that when I'm around people, I'm always asking them about them. You know, how are things going? How's the family? How's work? How's the thing? So on and so forth. And you ask all those questions, and then there's kind of silence. Like, aren't you going to ask me about, like, I don't care if you do. But I'm just surprised at how little people ask me about me. Again, that's not the point, but it just shows, particularly around unbelieving people is what I'm talking about, is just how little genuine care is in the world. You know, something that we bring as believers is the kind of this this heart that God gives us that we are genuinely interested in people. And like I said, we can't fake that. We We can choose certain things to build that up and foster that in our life. But it also is just a work of the Spirit. There's just an aspect of us growing in God, renewing our minds, guarding our hearts, being in the Word, praying, all those things we do, allowing the Holy Spirit to empower us, to fill us, to be the one that that is living His life through us effectively. Like we are supposed to be just a conduit of the power and influence of God. And so when we're becoming like that, we're becoming like Jesus Guess what? Genuine interest happens pretty, pretty normally. And so that, with so many aspects of Christian life, that's what it's about. Choices that we make to welcome the presence of God, to engage with the presence of God, choices we would make to build things up in us, but then looking for the spiritual influence and spiritual power to be that very thing. And so building up our genuine interest with other people You know, I think the church is a place that we should learn that, that we grow to understand that. I would say if you're not very good at it, the church is a great place to learn. Like you you just start engaging in relationships. You start interacting with people. Let me learn how to do that. I mean, so many times people are stopped from genuine relationship because of insecurity, you know, whether it's, oh, like they might, you know, I, like I don't feel like I'm up to the task or, you know, maybe they might not like me if they learn how what I am, you know, and so therefore, you know, like there's a vulnerability in getting to know people. There's a vulnerability in a relationship. And so to recognize that God supports us in who we are so now we can be to other people what they need us to be, but in the context of my, me getting out of myself and not being hindered by the insecurity I have about myself to interact with people, to not only know, but be known in terms of the relationships that we have with each other. And and, and what will happen is this genuine interest will flow. And so what Paul is saying, again, commending Timothy to them, that he's already got that for you. Like when when I talk about the, uh, the, the Philippians to Timothy, he gets excited about what's going on. He cares about what's going on. Hey, Paul, what can we pray for? You know, how can I help? I know you're in prison. You're kind of stymied in terms of how you can affect them. How can I be used by God and by you to be your emissary to them? And so that's what he's saying about 
Timothy, it says in the end of verse 21 here, for everyone looks out for his own interests and not those of Jesus Christ. You know, and I think I asked this question last week when, we, when Paul says here, for everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. What does that remind you of? It reminds you of verse 4 in Philippians 2 where it says, each of you should not look, only, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of, uh, interests of others. So again, as Paul is encouraging the Philippians to be a certain way, Philippians just recognize that the guy I'm sending to you, he's already there. He's already concerned for you in the way that Jesus is concerned for you. You know, our own interests versus the interests of Jesus Christ. You know, I wonder to what extent, where you are right now, what is more prevalent in your life? Is it more your interests or the interests of Jesus Christ? Again, what are those watershed decisions that we make? How we orient our understanding of things, our execution of things, our pursuit of things. Again, is it about my interests or it about the interests of Jesus Christ? So a question I have for you is what would you say are Jesus' interests? What are Jesus' interests? When you think about, okay, you're not looking for your own interests, looking for Jesus, what, what, what is Jesus trying to accomplish? What is tra- Jesus trying to get done? I'll, I'll welcome answers. <laughs> well, the salvation of other people. That's certainly one of Jesus' interests. Yep. Well, the, go- the sharing of the gospel, sharing of Christ. Yep. Well, loving, loving each other, loving people. Yep. Yeah, encouraging and building each other up. For the joy set before him, he endured the Christ. Good, like yeah, I suppose there is interest in Jesus in having a suffer. This, the, the, what's that? Well, certainly knowing God, promoting God. Like, to, to me, there's an aspect of the interest of Christ that is about unbelievers, about them coming to greater understanding, a greater pre- appreciation for who God is, what the gospel is, so on and so forth. There's also an aspect of Jesus' interest being about our fellowship, building up believers, growing in Christ. There's also an interest in your life for you to be sanctified. Like that is something that Jesus is very passionate about. And I would say on some level, when we think about the interests of Jesus, the thing that he would almost emphasize enough is our sanctification. And I say this all the time, but the reason why I believe it's the most important is what you control the most. What you control the most is your knowledge of God, your willingness to follow, your willingness to engage, your willingness to interact with Him. And so therefore, when we think about who we are in Christ, what kind of person am I becoming, that's a primary interest that Jesus has. Then, when that happens, all those other things are taken care of as well. That when we become the person God wants us to be in ourselves, that again, I become purified, sanctified, the fruit of the Spirit flowing through me, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. When that is happening, now other people will be affected. Now all of a sudden, when I'm sharing the gospel and I'm talking about Jesus, it's natural, it's compelling, it's convicting. You know, I love what the Bible says about Jesus. Like you read the Gospels and, the, you know, after the Sermon on the Mount, what, and other times too, but what does it say? This guy speaks with an authority that I've never heard before. You know why, why I believe that is? It's because Jesus was fully convinced. He was fully convinced of who he was, what truth he was communicating, what the Father desired of him and the Father's present with him. So when you're fully convinced, now all of a sudden you speak with authority. Like, like, like you, I, I can guarantee you that this is true. I can guarantee you this is right. I can guarantee you this is the way to go. And so it, it, it's so significant in terms of the interest of Jesus, of, of us being built up in God, So that then we would be to other people what God would want us to be. And so it doesn't help when what our focus is our interests. What do I want? What am I going to do? That is what the world is all about. That is what the world is encouraging you to think about. What do you need? What do you want? What do you desire? That's what's more important. 
in terms of gratifying, satisfying, affirming, accepting, all the things that are focused on self. And yet God, you know, in, in Jesus fulfilling his, his sins, to realize you're not neglected. Like you will never, you will never follow Christ, in, embrace the things of God, have God's power over you, and, and you're left in the shadows, or you're left on the side of the road. Well, I'm, I'm glad I used you, because now I'm going to move on to some. No, God cares about you. You know, he cares about you more than the things you will do for him. That's another thing that I say. God, God has done more for you than you will ever do for him. But God recognizes in terms of how he would complete us that the best person we could be, even for me, is to make my life about him and other people. That is just the bottom line. So again, when we think about everyone who looks off their own interests, that's a natural human compulsion. God is trying to say, don't go there. Don't do that. Think about the interests of Jesus because you can trust him. You can trust him for what interest he has over you and for you because it will only lead to his glory. It will only lead to our benefit. It will only lead to the benefit of other people. And that's really what he's talking about in terms of Tim Timothy, because he is this person, boy, you, you, you can trust him in terms of me sending him to you. Now, verse 22, but you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served me in the work of the gospel. This word proved points to being put to the test and passing. I guess I didn't put animations on this. Um, and so basically what Paul is saying here is I'm not, I'm not sending you a, a person that's new, that's unchallenged, that's unproved, that, that hasn't been through the ringer, that hasn't had experience in terms of what he is doing. So that's the significance of, again, him talking about in, in verse 22, but you know that Timothy has improved. So in other words, again, he's, he's, he cares about you genuinely. He, he cares about the things of Christ and is used for Jesus' interest. And he's been proved in that. Like he's, he's been challenged in terms of being put to the test and he passed the test. But, but Paul also considered Timothy as a son and Timothy regarded Paul as a father. You know, the closest of that relationship. You know, you know sometimes it's, it's, it's good or bad to presume things from the Bible. When, but when the Bible talks about Timothy's life, it only talks about the women in his life. His grandmother, his mother doesn't talk about a father, and so whether, whether, whether Timothy didn't have a father. And so now Paul, in terms of him being a spiritual father to him, comes along and in terms of the influence that Paul was to him to build him up even in con the context of what the world was lacking. And just another thing that is, is an opportunity for, another thing that we would consider in terms of our lives you know, what would I do for the sake of other people that have involved myself in someone else's life, maybe someone that doesn't have a father, and I become a father to them? That is something that God makes available to us. That where, where in terms of the different situations that we would be in, again, is the door opening for that to happen. You know, I always see the Bible as being kind of like tools in a toolbox, and, you know, when you're doing certain work, you know, you, you, maybe you need certain tools, you know, and, and you, you, you probably know where the tools are, but, you know, that pipe wrench, well, that's the bottom of my toolbox. I don't very often use a pipe wrench, but you know something? When it's that big nut that needs to be turned and there's a lot of force that has to be on that because you're taking a drain off a sink, boy, that's exactly the thing you need. Like, that has been in a toolbox forever, for years, not used. But you know something? Here's a situation where that's required. And so I think sometimes what the Bible gives us is instruction. And maybe right now, there's, there's no one in your life that you would be the father to and then be a son to you in terms of someone outside of your family. But to recognize that that's a dynamic that the Bible talks to about how significant you can be to someone else. Again, not thinking of yourself. Nothing about your own interest, but the need of other people, and that is something God calls us to be. You know, but when then, what, what have they used the, the closeness of their relationship for? The work of the gospel, spreading the good news, and there's really no better purpose. No, no better purpose 
than working for the sake of the gospel, working for the promotion of Jesus Christ. You know, think about what Jesus offers us as human beings. It is life from death. It is light in the darkness. It, it is hell to heaven in terms of the nature of the salvation Jesus brings us to and makes available to us. I would say if you're not, if you're not in that place where you have not come to a place where you have believed on Jesus as your Savior, Recognize the Bible talks of him in the terms of him being the only point of, of a bridge, of a connection to God. Like, how do I, as a human being, in my finite sinful self, get in a relationship with a God that is holy and righteous? Well, most of the world would say, well, do a lot of good things. Improve yourself. Be the best person you can be. And, and, and maybe God will accept you. That is not the message of the Bible. The message of the Bible is you're hopeless, that there's nothing you can do to be saved. There's no good work you could ever perform in light of who God is. And so the need, thing we need desperately in our lives is God to come down to us with salvation, that Jesus comes, lives his life on this earth to reveal who God is, reveal that he is of God, he is God, and then he dies on the cross to bear our sins on his physical body. And that is the good news. That is the gospel. That is the, the message of Jesus Christ to a world that so desperately needs him, to people that so desperately need that in terms of making a connection with God. And that's what Timothy and Paul's relationship was all about you know, so I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see, see how things go with me, and I'm confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. And so as Paul, in verse 24 here, moves for, well, actually, let, let, me, let me just make this, I wasn't sure where this slide was, but it's a point we can make about these personal notes, is that we can appreciate these personal notes that are in the Bible it shows that the Bible was written in real time by real people dealing with real life, not some theological treatise of lofty principles that don't intersect with life. I mean, that is the whole of the Bible, that God communicates himself, manifests himself through the human context, through real life. The Bible does not point to, oh, this time that's another time that's not part of human history or to a place that's not really earth. No, God reveals himself in the real life of people to show that that's the kind of God he is. Like he wants to be with us in the context of everything we face, every problem you have, every decision you have to make, every situation. You, like God has direction for you. God cares about the choices you make and he wants those choices to be a benefit to you, to him, and to other people. And so God cares about that. And like there's no, there's no problem that you will ever have that God has not foreseen. There's no problem you will have that God has not seen. You know, God doesn't always protect us from things in terms of what we face in this earth, but he always promises to be present in the context of that. And he always promises that if you are called to his purpose, if you know and love him, all things will work together for the good. That as you engage with God and trust Him and go to Him in the constant of things you face, that, that, that's what He is going to foster in your life. So we don't, we don't overlook these per, this personal information, this personal communication, that it's like, like why, are you, why are you sharing like logistical information to me, Paul? Like, okay, Paul, I get you're in prison. You care about the Philippians. Okay, you're going to send Timothy to them. Okay, I, I understand why you would talk about Timothy. Hey, he's a great guy. I mean, have you ever been in a situation like that? You know, like, like, uh, like I can't do it, but I'm going to send this guy. And, and, and this is why you should appreciate that I'm sending this guy. If you've ever been in a situation like that, you're the boss. Oh, you know, I can't get that thing. Can you make that phone call? Can, can, can you go to the place and, and talk to the guy, do the thing? Okay, and then you call the person. Hey, hey, you know something? I can't be there, but I'm sending Joe. And you can trust Joe. Joe's got the credentials. He's got the capacity. He can handle it, okay? You good? You good? Okay. Like, Paul, 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 Paul is in this section. You good? 
I'm good. Are you good? Uh, okay, we're all good. Because Timothy's good. If Timothy's good, then you're good and I'm good. And, and that's really what he's communicating in these verses. So, uh, but it's all, it's all ministering and showing that God cares about real life. That, that so much of who God is is worked out in the things that we face, the people that we deal with, the circumstances that come along. God chooses to use those things to teach us about Him, teach us about ourselves, teach us about our willfulness, teach, teach us about all, all the things that God would encourage us to be that sometimes seem so distant from us. Like, really? I, you want me to be that? Well, let me dig into you more, God. Let me understand the spiritual power that you have for me in terms of being that. Let me humble myself before you. Not think about my interests, but think about the interests of Jesus in terms of what you're building up in me to make me more usable and valuable in your kingdom, whether that would be ministering to believers or ministering to unbelievers or effectively what it will be is both in your life. And so that's what this passage really has been about but what's interesting in terms of him move, uh, moving through these principles in terms of what he's doing, talking about Timothy, he moves on in verse 25 to talk about this gentleman Epaphroditus. And so it says here in verse 25, but I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. And so again, here is the Apostle Paul talking about who he's sending to him, sending to them and how they're going to be benefited by Timothy's ministry. Now he's talking about the person the Philippians have sent to Paul, sent to him. And so Paul moves on in these verses to talk about Epaphroditus who had been sent by the Philippians to Paul to assist Paul while he was in prison. I mean, you talk about real life. <laughs> you talk about the situations that Paul faced because of his dedication to the gospel. I know this, this personal information is normally left to the end of Paul's letters, but is brought up here because these two men are models of what Paul is encouraging the Philippians to be. And so the name Epaphroditus actually means charming. Just in case you're thinking about a name for your son, Epaphroditus might be, a, you know, hey, you know, charming, you know. I de desire this of you. Uh, but what four words does Paul use to describe this man's character? And this is really the, where, I, where I'm trying to get because it's, it's actually a good Memorial Day message. Uh, but anyways, it says, first he says he's brother, right? Um, my brother, Epaphroditus, my brother. The word literally means from the same womb. I mean, first of all, it talks about their common origin in Christ. We're both, we're both under Jesus. We're both saved by him. But it's also about reveals equality. One thing that's amazing about Jesus, Jesus erases, erases earthly distinction and puts us all under Christ. And it doesn't really matter what you are in the world. It really doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what wealth you have, what family you have, what college education you have, what skill set you have, what professional teams you've played for. It doesn't matter. I used to be a rock star. It doesn't matter. <laughs> You are in Christ. We're brothers. That, that, that's the biggest thing. Now, you know, talents, you know, there's a point to talk about that, but there's also a point to talk about just how common we are, how, how connected we are, that, that again, all, all of us are in great need for what Jesus brings to us, and once we come to in humility, get that, it's okay. Well, now the, the most significant thing I can say about myself is I'm a believer in Jesus. I'm, I'm part of the family of God. Oh, you're a believer in Jesus, you're part of the family of God, so therefore, we're the same in the most important aspect of life. And that's why uh, cliques, you know, separation, division that happens within the church because here's the wealthy people, here's the poor people, here's the white people, here's the black people, here's... No, 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 no. We're all in Jesus, and that's all that matters and so, therefore, there's an equality and connectedness that we have because of that. He also says he's his fellow worker. Again, rather than just saying Epaphrodite is a charming one, he's my brother, he's a fellow worker, meaning he got his hands dirty. 
You know, are we, are we oh, again, with the interest of Christ, thinking about what Jesus wants from me, am I engaging in the work of that? Am I engaging the work in terms of even building myself up in capacity in Christ? And then am I partnering with people, coming alongside people? You know, there's a message I gave, well, probably now six or seven years, getting involved in the mess of other people's lives. That's oftentimes what God is calling us to in terms of where we are trying to manage our own stuff. What, what things am I aware of? What am I engaging in that is about getting involved in the mess of other people's lives? And you start ministering to people, you start engaging with other people, you're going to see that everyone's a mess. E everyone has situations. Everyone has problems. Everyone has sin. Everyone's struggling. Everyone's dealing with ju just the reality of life and then becoming the person that God wants us to be. And then when you're dealing with unbelievers and the mess that's in their life, oh my gosh, like what, what has come in their life because they're a rejection of God, whether, whether they're not under his standards, not under his guidance in terms of what they should do, and then not uh, apart from his influence in terms of that. So again, he says, uh, is that for me? <laughs> Sorry to do it. Um, so it's, it's, what he's describing Epaphroditus as, my brother, my fellow work, and then fellow soldier. And so again, this is, this is the, like, this was the point I was trying to get to. So now we're going to have to stay for at least another 10 to 20 minutes. I'm, 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 I'm only partially joking. So fellow soldier, yeah, I mean, this, I mean this, this reminds the Philippians, I'm, yeah, particularly on Memorial Day, don't tell jokes like that. Yeah, this reminds the Philippians and us that Christian life is a battle. You know, we say, okay, he's my brother, he's a fellow worker, he's a fellow soldier. What? So, our lives is a battle. That when we, when we engage, you are not a common person. You do not have just a regular life. You just have, don't have mundane duties to fulfill. No one, no believer is ever in that state. Because again, we are in warfare. We have things that are coming against us. And we can choose what kind of soldier we're going to be. I think it really is a good thought for us on Memorial Day. And to remember, like if we think about, and it's fitting to remember those who have died. For those who have given their all for the sake of freedom, for the sake of our country, for what blessing we have in this country because of the freedom we have. Isn't that awesome? But is it more awesome than God? Is it more awesome to what we do as soldiers for Christ, promoting freedom? See, you can offer people freedom in their circumstance. Jesus offers freedom of the heart. And, and, and what we would be in the context of the freedom that God gives us to make the right choices is not the freedom to make wrong choices. It's the freedom to make right choices in terms of what God empowers us for. But we have to recognize that, that we have enemies. We have enemies that don't want to see that happen. They don't want you to mature in Christ, to give up control, to give up your life, to, 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 to make your life about Jesus and the glory of God, sanctification in terms of your life. Again, our enemies, sin and Satan, war against us. Sin and Satan war against. I will remind you that f flesh and blood, you know, uh, uh, again, it's, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but, about, but against principalities and powers that will have power over the evil in the, in the world. I know I'm butchering that, but the whole point being, people are not your enemy. People are not the ones that are against you. It is Satan and your sin and their sin that is against them and against you. And so we have to recognize that if we're talking about a spiritual battle here, we have to depend on spiritual resources, spiritual components in terms of what we would engage in a spiritual battle. You know, when you think about what the Bible says about both Satan and sin, I mean, it says that sin wars against your soul. You know, it says, don't be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Don't, don't, don't allow your life, your mind, your heart to be corrupted 
by the impulse of sin because what it's going to make you, what it's going to drive you to is completely inconsistent with what is good for you, good for others, and good for God in terms of what he would foster. And again, your sin nature is against you. Your sin nature and Satan, they are deceivers. They make themselves look one way when they're really the other way. And the Bible is full of descriptions of the, the, the priority, the importance of defending against them, of reaching out to the spiritual resources to fight the spiritual battle. You know, think about, think about the things that come against you and the things you do to protect your body. Oh, like yesterday, the sun is your enemy. Do you have sunblock on? Going to be on the sun? Do you have your sunblock on? No, I never use sunblock. But anyway, you know, you're going out in the woods. Here's the DT, the off. You know, are you protected against the ticks? You know, you're going in the water. Let me make sure I wear the thing. Like, really? Like, you do all those things to protect your body. What do you do to protect your soul? Like, these things, I'm afraid that this thing is going to come and harm my body. So let me do the thing, buy the product, spend the money to protect my body. Well, what about protecting your soul? Well, what about recognizing the danger that we're all confronted with in terms of the influence of Satan and the influence of sin in our hearts? And how hard are we working? How much are we recognizing that that is warfare? That we are a soldier. And I think we are first a soldier, again, in our hearts, in our minds, so that then we can be used as a soldier in the context of other people. But not, but not seeing uh, people as our enemies, but fighting for the cause of Christ in their life. I mean, spiritual battles take spiritual weapons. These two great passages that we'll go really quickly through, but we might have to come back to them next week. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 says this, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we can take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And so first recognizing, again, that we don't fight warfare in the same way that the world fights warfare, that it is a spiritual battle, taking spiritual resources to confront the things that are in my heart. I just so love the fact that Paul, after talking about, yes, we don't fight with the, with the weapons of the world, but the weapons of Christ, but then he goes right to our minds. He goes right to our thoughts. What are the pretensions? What are the arguments? What's the deception in that stare? And are you going to take your thoughts captive to recognize that the primary aspect of warfare in our lives is taking our thoughts captive, overcoming the lies of sin and Satan, and promoting the truth of Christ? Now, that doesn't happen on a dime. That doesn't happen just, oh, well, let me find that Bible verse that... You know, when you think, about, you think about the training that soldiers go through to be a fellow soldier, to be a good person in battle, it's not like, where's that, where's that gun? Is that clean? Is the gun clean? Like, like where, they're prepared. They're training. They're practicing all the time. And so how much is that an expression? How much is that a picture for our lives to think in terms of our lives being a battle? And again, we're going to fight I'm, I'm, you know, the, the, what, what Amy and Shelley are going to talk about in terms of renewing your mind and taking your thoughts captive, how, how, how important that is, how important it is for you to recognize that you have a choice, that you can do that through Christ. I mean, the Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, able to divide soul and spirit, joint and marrow, able to discern the thoughts and intents of a person's heart. I have hid my, your Word in my heart so... I might not sin against you. And so this book is a primary defense, primary opponent in terms of facing the temptation that comes. Like it's the primary spiritual weapon that we use. But the Holy Spirit, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses. 
And so we have to grow in those spiritual components. But then as we grow in the influence of God, it always boils down to, I am going to think this, and I'm not going to think that. I'm going to do this, and I'm not going to do that. And we will never get beyond the need we have to choose, this is what is right, and this is what is wrong. This is a thought that is coming to draw me away from the things of God, and so I'm going to take that thought captive, set it aside, and I'm going to think the very thing that God wants me to think. Some ways you can't talk about 2 Corinthians 10 without talking about 1 Corinthians 10. And so no temptation is overtaking you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. I mean, what a promise. What a promise God is giving us. How, how, how personal is this? How, how, inter, how, how like God knows what we're dealing with. God knows the nature of human life. No temptation is coming across your mind that everyone hasn't been tempted with. Don't think you're alone. Satan loves to think, make you think that you're alone. You're the only one that could ever do this. No, common to man. But you know, in the context of every temptation, God always has a provision. He always has a place for you to go, a decision to make that is different, that is counter to what sin and Satan is encouraging. And we have to take that track we have to make that choice. we got to take that way out. And I think the way that 1 Corinthians 10 and 2 Corinthians 10 combine is when we are taking our thoughts captive, the truth of Christ is the way out. The truth of Christ is like, okay, with the temptation, there's always a way out. What's the truth of God? Well, what is God leading us to in the context of that? But to recognize that that decision is not a casual decision. That is not just something to see lightly. You see that in the context of battle. You know, 1 Peter 5, 8 says this, that Satan is prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. Satan wants to devour you. Satan takes his warfare against us very seriously. And so we have to do the same. That, that, that for, for us to like, set, like he, say, he loves to separate us and make us think that it's not really important. But when you're, when you're in warfare, every decision is, por- is important. You know, you think about, so, you know, my fellow soldier, the guy that's on the battlefield, neck and neck, arm and arm, we're going to get it done. Like what happens when, oh, you know, my gun's not clean. Or, I, I, oh, I, 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 I'm sorry, I forgot to put the bullets in. I left the jacket at home. <laughs> I got the gun, but I don't have... Like, never, right? You'd never go into physical battle like that. Oh, I just don't have my weapon with me. Well, how many times do we enter and, like, like you know, so I'm just going to leave the gun at home. I'm just going to go and do the... Th- no! Like, that, like the, 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 the comparison that Paul is encouraging us and the Philippians think in terms of, as he's talking about Epaphroditus being a fellow soldier, is in waking us to this whole dynamic of the spiritual battle that we are in. And God is always willing to equip us. God is always willing to grow us. God is always willing to build us up in the ability we have to face the temptation that we face. Again, so we're not... We're, we're, we're born in Christ to win. And so why aren't we winning? If we're, if we're not grasping hold of the things of God, that's why. Again, we're not taking the thoughts captive. We're not, we're not winning the battle in, in, the, in the trenches where it matters, where the thoughts are. We think of behavior, like behavior is losing the battle. Behavior is not losing the battle. It's the thoughts that are losing the battle. And when you think wrong, you're going to do wrong. All of a sudden, sin is going to look tempting. It looks, it looks, again, those pretensions, those arguments. And, and they come in various forms. Like, sometimes that, it's about fear. It's about insecurity. You know, it's, it's about, you know, uh, you, know, don't, you know, don't do that ministry thing. Don't share the gospel. All the things that we confront. But to recognize the warfare 
that we are in and, and, and what this enlightens us to. I think particularly when we think about Memorial Day, not to, not to compare the two on any stretch in terms of the sacrifice, but in the same way we would think about a, a soldier engaging in battle, what are we doing as we engage in battle that the Bible clearly describes that we, in, we are in? You know, for the sake of Christ, for the sake of ourselves, and for the sake of others that will be affected by the decisions that we make. Let's bow and let's pray. And so, Father, we just do thank you for your word and how it does engage with us in real time, in our real lives. It, it recognizes the things that we struggle with on a daily basis, that there's no one beyond needing to hear uh, the, the truth of the battle that we are under, the things that assail us, the subtlety of deception, how Satan seeks to creep in and make us think, think the very thing that is wrong is right. Father, I pray that you make us aware and sensitive to the things that are right, the conviction and the revelation that comes to, to the insidious nature of that deception and how corrupting it is and the danger that exists, all the things that Satan blinds us of and to. Father, I just, I just pray that we, we become more winners in the way that we conduct ourselves, the battles that we face, and that, Father, the world would be impacted, that people will grow more because of us, that people will be saved because of us, that a testimony would be more genuine because we're fully in, fully engaged in the interests of Christ. And so, Father, we just lift this all before you. In his name, amen.